I've been waiting 40 years for this. They called themselves Ghostbusters. What exactly makes a Ghostbusters movie a Ghostbusters movie? Big personalities in jumpsuits, proton packs, distinctive ghouls. Maybe some jokes. How much more than that is really necessary? Those trappings were enough to make the 1984 original a classic and every Ghostbusters movie that has come since has been judged based on how well it assembles these building blocks. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire bears some superficial resemblance to its better forerunners and for some the allure of more time with Bill Murray Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson in uniform will be impossible to ignore. But the Ghostbusters Afterlife sequel buckles under the weight of an uninspired ballooning plot that leaves little room for comedy, which is a problem because it's Ghostbusters. Frustratingly Frozen Empire gets off to a solid enough start, beginning with the wise move to port the action back over to New York City. Jason Reitman's Amblin-esque small-town approach to Ghostbusters Afterlife delighted some, but for those of us who found that story of Spengler reconciliation to be slow and self-serious, the pivot back to a more stimulating locale feels right, and those feelings are momentarily validated by a fun ghost chase through the city streets that director Gil Keenan uses to re-establish the Spengler family dynamics. Amidst the I will turn this car around chaos going on inside the ECT-01, we find that Callie and stepteacher Gary have moved kids Phoebe and Trevor back to New York to join the family business. The movie's opening salvo is, unfortunately, also its strongest. The Ghostbusters once more run afoul of former EPA inspector and current mayor Walter Peck, who uses their recklessness as an excuse to restrict their efforts and completely bench Phoebe from the team just when they'll need her most. The plucky awkward heroine was a consistent highlight of Afterlife. But while Grace remains charming and offbeat as ever in the role here, Frozen Empire saddles her with a completely muddled arc in which a character we know to be very smart is forced to do some very dumb things. Phoebe's angsty clashes with the rest of the family put her into the path of Melody, a kindred spirit with unfinished business. Aside from ham-handed stabs at cross-dimensional romance for Phoebe to consider, Melody feels totally adrift, especially once Frozen Empire trots out its bafflingly complicated plot. The Ghostbusters. Can I tell you something else? What? Buster makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. As the central ghost story unfolds, the audience is asked to track the importance and function of all manner of minutia secret explorer organizations, ancient orbs, ghost prisons, mystical fire heroes and the broken horns of a demon all come into play. And hey, maybe all those things sound good on paper they sound like they'd be great for the cover of a metal album but all of the doom saying and mythology that has to be built into the script to account for that stuff leaves the characters with little to do but continually re-rack the stakes it's an act of desperation and overcompensation on the part of keenan and reitman's script if one element of the overstuffed story isn't working for you maybe you'll find another reason to stay invested the vengeful god opposing the Ghostbusters sets up a third act that rapidly devolves into a mess of CG ice and snow and there's even a skybeam for good measure. It all leaves the cast seeming exhausted by the end, collectively unsure of how much they should balance the weight of the apocalyptic circumstances with the need to keep things as light as a Ghostbusters movie probably should be. Frozen Empire's unfocused and repeated attempts at keeping these characters relevant for modern audiences hold it back at every turn. Ghostbusters are finished. Right, well... Overruled. Sustained. Thank you. That aspect of Frozen Empire really highlights what's missing here a cohesive central unit of funny Ghostbusters. The Spenglers spend much of the runtime at odds with each other heck. Trevor spends half the movie off on a solo ghost hunt and much of their interplay feels like pot shots meant to blow off steam. Rudd and Kuhn have good chemistry, but few laughs come from the trials of integrating a new father figure into the family. As the scale of the spectral threat increases, Keenan piles on supporting character after supporting character to keep up with exposition duties, with Ghostbusters vet Annie Potts and comedians James Ackister and Patton Oswalt all stopping by to dump information when the plot calls for it. Kumail Nanjani has a slightly larger role as Nadim, a vape shop owner with a part to play in the Ghostbusters' plans to save the day, but not even Nanjani's reliable comedic voice can rise above his character's preposterous function within the plot. Frozen Empire can't even bear to let go of minor afterlife characters like Podcast and Lucky, who don't bring much to the table here and call even more attention to the story's slipshod construction, that goes double for the returning Mini Puffs, whose obnoxious presence feels like insult added to injury totally unfunny. Sadist marshmallows aren't cheap to render, and with so many of Frozen Empire's failings hinging on distracting CG crap, it makes me wish the filmmakers had spent that time and money on shooting a couple extra scenes where the talented cast was allowed to be funny on camera. Can I be of any help? 
Melnitz in uniform! Yeah. At least Frozen Empire makes good on Afterlife's promise of more time with the original, surviving Ghostbusters Ackroyd's Ray Stance, Murray's Peter Venkman, and Hudson's Winston Zeddemore, of the three. Ray feels the most successfully integrated into the Spengler's story, in contrast to Stance's struggle to let go of his ghost-busting days, Ackroyd's warmth, and the actor's comfort with taking a back seat to the next generation, end up buying him a lot of goodwill, that pays off in one of Frozen Empire's only strong emotional moments, with Ray pondering what it's like to be a ghost a blurring of the boundaries between a paranormally obsessed actor and the paranormally obsessed character he plays. Winston has amassed a fortune large enough to bankroll all manner of ghostbusting, but while the outsized leadership role for Hudson is cool, the intriguing notion of the Ghostbusters' transformation into a national franchise is totally backgrounded, for ages. The story went that it was Murray's reluctance to reprise the role of Venkman that delayed a Ghostbusters sequel for so long and after his cameo in Afterlife. His slightly larger presence in Frozen Empire doesn't quite make the wait worth it. Venkman breezes in and out with that casual Murray charm, which is good for a couple laughs, but by the time New York City is freezing over, Venkman has nothing to do but look mildly concerned when the CG frost starts to creep up his legs, confoundingly for a movie that has zero issues trafficking in nostalgia plays. Frozen Empire keeps Venkman and Mayor Peck apart for all but one brief exchange late in the movie, given the dearth of strong comedic material here. Separating the combatants in Ghostbusters' funniest and testiest verbal sparring matches seems like a major oversight. Ghostbusters' Frozen Empire races onto thin ice overburdened with disparate, uninspired ideas and no one behind or in front of the camera quite knows what to do once the movie's flailing in the water. The new generation of Ghostbusters have to give up too much time to an overcomplicated plot time that could have been used to embellish the bedrock elements of comedy horror that the 1984 original deployed so well. If all you need to feel good about busting is ghosts, jumpsuits and proton packs, you may have some fun, but Frozen Empire makes one thing clear the franchise should be put in cold storage until someone can figure out how to do justice to the central concept without Murray, Ackroyd, Hudson, and Potts dropping by to prevent mass hysteria. That's all for today, be sure to like and subscribe for more content.